starts right now. Confusion in a child death case playing out in court. Five-year-old Dominic Aguilar Acevedo was allegedly killed here in San Antonio, but his body found in Colorado. His mother, Nicole Aguilar, and her boyfriend, Daniel Garcia, are charged in the case. The defense attorney for Garcia told the court that the Bear County District Attorney himself said the murder charge was a mistake. Erica Hernandez in court today to try to get some answers. On September 20th, a discovery hearing was held for Daniel Garcia to sort through evidence issues. Garcia, according to online court records, is charged with the murder of five-year-old Dominic Aguilar Acevedo back in July 2021. In that September hearing, Garcia's current attorney, Michael Gross, tells the judge that he met with the first defense attorney on the case, Javier Oliva, and wanted notes regarding a meeting Oliva had with District Attorney Joe Gonzalez. Per the court transcript, Mr. Gross said, quote, according to Oliva, Joe says, look, the murder charge is a mistake. We're going to reduce those charges, end quote. 226 District Court Judge Velia Mesa asked the state to clarify, and Prosecutor Amanda Vasquez says she wasn't aware of any meeting but would ask about it. In a follow-up hearing this morning, Judge Mesa asked Vasquez what she was able to find out about that meeting. I had asked about this getting it upstairs, and I haven't gotten a response yet on whether uh, Mr. Gonzalez met with the prior attorney. We asked Michael Gross for an interview after today's hearing, but he told us he doesn't do interviews on cases that are still open. We also reached out by email to the district attorney's office requesting an interview with Gonzalez about what he allegedly said and were told, quote, the case is still pending. Our office does not comment on pending cases. As for Javier Oliva, we spoke to him by phone today and he didn't want to do an interview or be quoted about this case. According to online court records, his representation of Garcia ended in July 2022. For now, Garcia's case has no trial date as evidence issues still need to be cleared up, as well as getting an answer if there was ever a meeting between Oliva and Gonzalez. The case will be called back on October 31st. As for Nicole Aguilar, she has been set a trial date that will be in February of next year. If she is found guilty, she is facing up to life in prison. At the Kathina Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. An update now on the war in Israel. We now know at least 22 Americans are among the more than 1,000 killed in the Hamas attacks. Right now, the terrorist group is still holding people hostage. In a phone call with President Biden, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said the attacks, which started Saturday and are still ongoing, are incomparable to anything that Israel has ever experienced. We've never seen such savagery in the history of the state. And they're even worse than ISIS. The Israel Defense Forces is preparing for a ground offensive in Gaza. In a warning to Hamas, an IDF spokesman called for the release of hostages if Hamas wants to, quote, come out in any way from this conflict alive, end quote. Back here at home, the pain of that war is so close to so many. One Bear County commissioner tells our Daniela Ibarra that this war feels personal. Let me be very clear. The Palestinian civilian casualties over the coming months is on the hands of Hamas. A bold statement from Bear County Precinct 3 Commissioner Grant Moody. The comments on the war in Israel were some of the first made during this week's commissioner's court. It's something that people need to know about. They need to recognize what's going on, the atrocities uh, that were committed. The mission is personal for Moody. The former Marine spent time in the Middle East fighting terror. Safety has a cost. And, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why we need to, to be there for our allies when, when they need us most. Moody also visited Israel in 2018 and still keeps in touch with those he's met. I think we need to be right there shoulder to shoulder with them. Ian Smith, the director of St. Mary's graduate program in international relations, says it's not clear if any refugees will come to the U.S. or Texas. If they do, I would suspect if anywhere in, in the U.S. ends up seeing refugees being brought in, uh, we would be pretty high on the list, given our experience and our, our capabilities here. The message from Commissioner Moody is clear. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And that's exactly what we're seeing, you know, in Israel today. Danielle Ibarra, KSAT 12 News. 
San Antonio City Councilman John Courage is asking for donations to help fund what he says is the city's first ever gun buyback event, or as he calls it, a voluntary weapons exchange. People looking to get rid of up to 20 unwanted weapons can turn them in at the Alamo Dome on November 19th. They'll get HEB gift cards worth up to $300 per weapon, depending on the type. Courage said that he does not expect it will do much to lower the crime rate, but he thinks it could still help save lives by taking guns out of circulation. If you're a bad guy, you're not going to turn in your gun, you know, but but then again, bad guys go buy guns wherever they can. And a lot of those guns have been stolen from people's homes or from people's cars or, you know, in, in other ways. And so we want to eliminate those opportunities. Courage has put up to put up $100,000 worth of discretionary funds from his district to help fund this event. And Mayor Ron Nirenberg and Councilwoman Marina Alderete Gavito have also contributed. A fund has been set up through the San Antonio Area Foundation to accept more donations. Looking ahead now, Muertos Fest returns to Hemisphere Park later this month. It is the largest Dia de los Muertos festival in Texas, bringing in over 100,000 people just last year. Now that Civic Park is open this year, organizers are expecting more space for friendes, local art vendors, and live performances. District 1 Councilwoman Sukor says she's looking forward to the altars made by high school students. What we know is that when students are engaged in activities like this outside of their regular hours of learning experience, it keeps them engaged throughout their year. So the more we can provide culturally relevant learning experiences for them, the stronger our students are going to graduate. Muertos Fest happening October 28th and 29th. If you're not able to make it out there on November 1st, we'll be airing some highlights from Muertos Fest right here on KSAT starting at 8 p.m. Always a fun event. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look outside with live cam. Plenty of clouds in this view, a break there off in the distance, and really just, just a gray day overall, Adam. Yeah, very gray. We're starting to see more breaks in the clouds, and I do think we'll have more sunshine for tomorrow afternoon. But you look at our time lapse, pretty gray over the past few hours. Now we're starting to see a few more of those breaks as sunset approaches and nears. 74 degrees was our high temperature. That's 10 degrees below average. Three hundredths of an inch of rain in the bucket at the airport. Noticeably higher amounts from yesterday and this morning farther south of San Antonio. Parts of Frio County had over an inch, but not much around San Antonio. High temperatures today because of the clouds, mostly 70s off to the west where we had some sun. Del Rio 83, Dryden 85, Ozona 81, and even Laredo 82 degrees for the high temperature. As we go through the evening, temperatures just falling off a little bit. Near 70 degrees is going to be the rule. And then upper 60s to start the day tomorrow. Fog developing. We'll take a look at the fog future cast talk about Friday's cold front what it means for the weekend in just a bit all right see you then thanks Adam let's take a look at traffic out there we've taken a look at the cameras around town some good news to report no big tie-ups to tell you about you could tell here at I-10 and Callahan those lanes off in the distance there a little slow going as they approach 410 really kind of always a slow down in that interchange area but no major tie-ups at this hour now for a story of a Latina trailblazer back when San Antonio City Council looked much different than it does today. Maria Antonetta Berasubal became the first Latina on City Council back in 1981. Among her many accomplishments and honors, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Southwest Voter Registration Education Project. Tonight she shares what's inspired her life of public service with our Jesse Degollado. I'm here in this country because of Maria Cervantes Rodriguez. Maria Antonieta Berriazabal cherishes a photo of her Mexican immigrant ancestors for good reason. That's my life. That's what I know. That's who I am. I am them. Perhaps it's why this little girl from Laredo grew up with a lifelong commitment to community. Who needs somebody to advocate for them that is not being heard? City Hall was Maria Antonieta Berriozabal's home away from home for 10 years. But the first time someone said, you want to run for city council. Oh my goodness, I would never do that. Whatever that was is like, oh no, that, that's not me. It took her husband Manny, perhaps using a little reverse psychology. You're not going to run because you're scared of losing. I said, no, I'm not. 
I'm gonna run. So. <laughs> Yet the significance didn't hit her until she heard her campaign workers say it. Voting for la primera Latina, vote for the first Latina. I was just so happy, like there's no way that I'm gonna lose. Uh, you know, I knew that and I won. The District 1 seat, once held by the then-future mayor, Henry Cisneros. Berriozabal served five terms before losing a tight runoff in 1991 to become the first Latina mayor. Still, Berriozabal says she takes pride in the issues she ran on, unpopular though they were at the time, when the city was rapidly growing. Don't vote for her. She voted against the Alamo Dome. She voted against Fiesta, Texas. She voted against zoning over the aquifer. Why do we just have to go north? I mean, can we invest in, in the inner city? An advocate on behalf of immigrants, women and children, the environment, and other issues, Betty Ozabal says not all Latinos have realized their dreams. What are we going to do for the others? And that's the question mark. I don't know. Jesse de Goyado, KSAT 12 News. An incredible life of public service. If you're interested in seeing more of our stories for Hispanic Heritage Month, we've got you covered. Scan this QR code you see here on your screen to see all of KSAT's Hispanic Heritage Month stories. Do you have some medical questions? Well, starting next week right here on the 6 o'clock news, we are taking your health care questions to local doctors. Whether you're curious about the latest health care trends or just seeking some advice, we've got you covered. If you want to submit a question, all you need to do is scan that QR code. Then we will take your questions to the doctors. KSAT 12's Doc Talk starts next Thursday at 6.30. I just want to see what happened, and I'm not being allowed to see it. Still to come here on the News at 6, a battle for information. A family looking for answers after their loved one died in the Bear County Jail over a month ago. Why the family says the sheriff's office isn't telling the full story. That's coming up at 630. But coming up next, the eclipse just three days away after the break. We'll explain why looking at it without eye protection could permanently damage your eyes. Welcome back. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. More than 50 Texans are safe after being stuck in Israel when that country declared war over the weekend. Some of them, though, still trying to make it back. We're going to show you exactly what they're going through and also show you what the travel situation is around Israel, just in case you still have family there. Also, have you noticed people around you getting sick, like a lot of people? Well, you're not alone. Tonight, health experts are going to weigh in on the current wave of seasonal illnesses around San Antonio and also what you can do to make sure that you and your family stay safe and healthy. We'll see you for these stories and a lot more tonight on The Night Beat. Thanks, Stephanie. Well, special glasses, homemade cereal box viewers, whatever you're using right now is the time to gear up for the annular solar eclipse on Saturday. Without it, you could destroy some of your vision. As Ursula Perry explains tonight, there's science behind the danger from the experts. It's called solar retinopathy, where the sun's rays are so strong that they actually um, create scars and burn the retina permanently. That's what it's called, but what exactly happens to your naked eye if you fail to protect it from the sun's rays, particularly while trying to enjoy the solar eclipse? So there's a two lens system and think of it like a magnifying glass, like when, you know, like when we're all little kids and we go out into the sun and use a magnifying glass to burn a hole in a piece of tissue paper or something like that. We have lenses inside our eye that's doing the same thing. So the first lens encounters the bright sun, then magnifies it to the second, creating basically a burn spot or arc in your vision. It's not so much just looking at the eclipse, it's the idea that you're staring and waiting for it to happen. That's when the damage usually occurs, and unfortunately, if you're not wearing glasses like this, the damage you do to your eye can be permanent. So as, as the moon is coming across, there's this, you know, half a moon or semicircle that we're looking at to see like, oh cool, we're starting to see the shadow occur. But during that time when it's coming across, part of the sun is not blocked, and that is the portion that can actually do damage. The damage can appear like a dark spot or more likely an arc with this type of eclipse. Special polarized glasses won't protect you, just something called ISO-approved filtered lenses will. 
first of all, they're extremely dark, right? I mean, if you put yeah. these, if you put these on, it's like you can barely see. I can actually in this room, I can't see anything. So they're so dark, you can't see anything other than looking at the. Said. Twelve news. And if you need them, you can get a free pair of those glasses at the San Antonio Zoo starting at 9 a.m. Parkhurst Vision Center has partnered with the zoo for a safe eclipse viewing. Don't forget, we are your eclipse authorities. And on Saturday, beginning at 9 a.m., we'll have coverage of the eclipse right here on KSET. If you want to see more of our stories leading up to the big event, just scan that QR code on your screen and you can find everything you need to know at KSET.com. And right now on our website as well, we have a safe and fun alternative to those eclipse glasses. If you can't get any, a pinhole projector. It's pretty cool. All you need is a few household items and a cereal box like foil, tape, scissors. For a list of all su the supplies and the time and the steps you'll need, just find our recent science with Sarah story on KSAT.com. We've had one of those pinhole projectors floating around uh, the weather center for a while. Mm -hmm. I got to make one. Kasky's got it. Yeah, there you go. You know what's cool? First of all, you get to enjoy some sugary cereal. <laughs> the other thing is that even if you just look at LED lights around the house or around the studio around here, you can see the individual little diodes. It's really cool to see. Oh. So it's, it's kind of interesting. That's a way to indirectly view the upcoming solar eclipse on Saturday. Quick reminder what the eclipse is. We have the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun. Of course, the sun is shining on the earth. Every so often, that moon moves perfectly in front of the sun to shade out that sunlight. This is not a total eclipse. That's a bigger deal and happens on April 8th in parts of Texas and including parts of our area. But there will be that ring of fire. So the view from here is what you're gonna look up and see with the approved eyewear is that ring of fire around the sun 90% of the sun obscured by the moon, but even that remaining 10% can and will cause eye damage if you look directly up at it without the approved eyewear. At its peak, is it gonna get dark outside? No, but it will dim. The sky will dim as if a cloud is shading the sun or as if you're standing in the shade. That's what it's going to be, be like. Whereas in April, that's a different story. We'll cover that as that time nears. Saturday morning, 1023 AM, the partial eclipse begins and then by 1054 we're at our max and really the peak annularity will last for about four and a half minutes here in San Antonio where we have that ring of fire and then we it fades away. The partial eclipse ends at 133 PM. You know, the temperature could drop as much as 10 degrees during that time frame. Here's a look at the path. This is for this annular eclipse. You know, some people are saying, go to Utopia, go to Hondo, go to Divine. Sure you could, but honestly, I'm staying right here in San Antonio. The only difference between the center line of this eclipse and the outer edge here in San Antonio is about 34 seconds of the peak eclipse. So it's still gonna last four and a half minutes here for the peak with the ring of fire. For me, that's plenty of time. In April, it's a different story. We're gonna cross that bridge when that time comes. Visibility is going to be reduced again tonight and a bit of dampness in the morning tomorrow, but that dampness is in the form of fog. Visibility is under five miles and at times under two miles in parts of our area. Visibility fluctuates quite a bit in the foggy conditions. We'll see that through the morning and the morning commute. You plan for some fog and still some damp roadways, but no real rain out there. And then by 10 o'clock, the, the fog should clear out. Sky gets a little sunny into the afternoon. We're dealing with the high dew points. Dew points back well into the 60s, right near 70s. So you feel the stickiness outside. It's not hot outside, but you notice that mugginess. It doesn't have that crisp fall like feel that changes by Saturday morning. Muggy tomorrow and Friday, Saturday, all the way through the weekend and into next week. That humidity swept away in dew points down in the 30s and 40s. So 7 a.m. tomorrow, 67 degrees by noon, 79. Sunny, not until the afternoon at 87 degrees of southeast wind at 10 to 15. 92 in Del Rio, 89 Carrizo Springs. D if the fog and low clouds linger a little longer than anticipated, temperatures will be probably a little bit lower than what we're showing. But right now we're expecting 89 Lavernia, Casterville, 88 and Bernie 
85 for the high temperature 90 on Friday and sunny cold front hits, but we don't feel those changes until this weekend 58 Saturday morning. Good viewing for the eclipse. I just want to point out early Saturday morning around and a little after sunrise, some lingering clouds, especially west of San Antonio, but they should mostly clear out by the time the eclipse really gets going. All right, we're looking forward to it. Thanks, Adam. A lot of excitement and anticipation about just how good the Spurs mm -hmm. could be this year. Yeah, there is a lot of anticipation and Pop's got the preseason to start figuring out his lineups. And of course, I'm sure that's still going to be an experiment in the regular season early on as well. Coming up, Mary Rominger has more on the potential of the Spurs. Yes, they have a lot of talent. Plus, Bruce Bochy is thrilled for his Texas Rangers coming up. And their Spurs guard Devin Vassell dapping up Manu at the conclusion of San Antonio's practice this morning. Ginobili spends a lot of time around the Spurs organization and his mentorship for this young group is priceless. Now there's no doubt this year's team has so much potential. So the real question is how would it all come together on the court? Mary Rominger is at the Spurs practice facility with more. A couple of days removed from Monday's preseason opener, the Spurs are focused on gaining more comfortability with each other in live game action as they approach their second preseason game against Miami this Friday. Everybody pretty much can bring the ball up the court. Um, I think our biggest thing is just going to be able to, if we can all play together. You know, at the end of the day, it's only one ball, so we all got to move, we all got to cut, we all got to make sure that uh, the spacing is right, and that's just going to be our biggest thing. I think the, through these preseason games and obviously, obviously through the beginning of the season, it's just going to be an adjustment. You know, we haven't, even last year, me, KJ, Jeremy, all of us haven't really played together like that. So for us to be able to kind of get some continuity going, it's just going to be big for us, truthfully. The way we're going to play this year, um, we're going to have so many different lineups. Um, you know, we have a lot of guys that can contribute in so many different ways. Um, and so just being able to try to, you know, build that chemistry right now, um, obviously throughout the game, you know, you want to get out to a, a good start with that starting lineup. But then, you know, as the game goes out, uh, game goes along, um, there's going to be so many different lineups. Um, and so just being able to, you know, get on the same page with one another right now, I think is our biggest key. With that, Trey Jones says he's finding many ways he can still impact the game from the point guard position. From Victory Capital Performance Center, Mary Rominger, KSAT 12 Sports. Thank you, Mary. Friday night will serve as another chance for the Spurs to get used to each other when they host the Heat in preseason play at 6.30 p.m. Up two games to one, the Houston Astros are playing the Minnesota Twins right now in game four of that ALDS. Houston took charge of the series yesterday, hammering the Twins 9-1 to at Target Field. During postgame, Dusty Baker was asked about the confidence of his team regardless of the situation. I mean, his guys just never seem to be phased. And that's the kind of club, you know, we have. I mean, it's a very confident club, not a cocky club. Um, you know, we don't, you know, showboat too much. We just play. And, uh, you know, the guys have a knack of pitch, you know, picking each other up. And from day to day, it could be, you know, a number of heroes, uh, um, you know, like today or, you know, somebody carries us on that particular day. And, uh, you know, our, our pitching was good. Our pitching was very good. And at last check, the Twins were leading the Astros 1-0 in the top of the second inning. We'll have highlights for you on the night beat. Now, the Texas Rangers beat the Baltimore Orioles 7-1 yesterday to sweep the O's three games to none in the ALDS. And now, Texas will play for the American League Championship. This is why you play the game. This is why I came back. Uh, you know, you have your, your moments, uh, the ups and downs, but, you know, to see those players, you know, celebrate, uh, I couldn't be happier for them, especially the ones that were here last year. You know, that was a tough year for them. Yeah, the last three or four years were yeah. tough for the Rangers, and now look at them. Big turnaround. Yep. Thanks, Larry. Coming up next here, a battle for information. Why a family believes the Bear County Sheriff's Office is not following their own policy after their loved one died in BCSO custody. Case that investigates after the break.